Welcome back to your PM edition of Newsfeed on this Sunday afternoon. My name is Busisiwa Gumete. We will continue uh, bringing you an update to your main top stories today, but also a review of what you are talking about on social media. We start with one of our Women's Month specials. The lives of women in South Africa have improved significantly in the last 25 years. That is the assertion of the government. In fact, President Cyril Ramaphosa reiterated this achievement when making the keynote address at the official Women's Day celebrations in Freiburg in the Northwest on Friday. He says that government has implemented policies to give practical expression to women's rights, to education, to health care, to basic services and to social support. Joining us in studio to reflect on this, on these achievements and some of the challenges still facing government is Deputy Minister in the Presidency of Women, Youth and People Living with Disabilities, Professor Lengiwe Mkize. Good afternoon to you, uh, Professor. Uh, good afternoon to the listeners. Good afternoon to you as well, Miss. Perhaps let's, let's start this interview with just reflecting on uh, this new position that you have taken on from May of this year, uh, which is quite different from uh, the one that Umam Batabile Zamini used to take up, which, you know, solely focused on women. Yeah, thank you very much for helping us to really deal with that. I, I realized as we are on the build up to the president's speech, many people were still referring to us as coming from the Department of Women. Mm -hmm. This new configuration of the department, I think it's strategic. It brings together uh, all, all the, the three groups, women, youth, and persons with disabilities, mm -hmm. which are really struggling with issues of equality and inclusion in society. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and so it gives us that opportunity of tackling them under one roof. And these are issues that you have dealt with for, for decades. I mean, you have a, 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 an impressive record for, um, dating all the way to, you know, Morris Isaacson's school in Soweto, which is where you grew up. But let, let's talk about what inspired your body of work. Yeah, I, you know, I cannot explain how it happened. <laughs> but I can remember as far back as the 70s, mm. where, at the time when after the... June 16, in yes. particular, the Soweto uh, uprisings. Many of us, I remember, we started focusing on detentions and, 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 girl, and girls, saying we must avoid at all costs uh, the detentions uh, because young women, were, some of them, were coming out of det det detention pregnant and there were specific uh, violations of their rights, yeah. which were different from those of men, like being humiliated as a prostitute. Why are you in politics? Are you looking for a man? You know, all those things, mm -hmm. I think they shocked one to the real world we are in, that men and women are treated differently. That, those were the, 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 the teens, yes, where already we could experience that. Mm. But what made you specifically go into, into this life of, of activism and, and politics? I cannot really explain because then I continued. I pursued the same line all the way through. Even when at a certain point I qualified as a clinical psychologist, the first cases I dealt with, I remember very well. <laughs> I worked with uh, the late uh, Achikumete and the families, Mkwege family yeah. and, and Mji's family. And I just focused on political psychology all the way. And, and I suppose it's consciousness of suffering at the time we drove one, made one to make clear choices as to whether you want to continue within the system and survive, or you want to be on the side of those who are opposed to the uh, system and defining it as such as the enemy of the people and fully uh, embracing the struggle. Yeah, and, and, and talking about the struggle, I'm listening to you detail some of the challenges that were faced by women and youth at the time, which are very similar to where we are now as a country, where women are, are still you know, on the sidelines of everything else that is happening, be it in the economy, uh, be it in, in politics as well. What's your analysis of 
the road that we have traveled as, as women in general? I think when you look at the 25 years, yes, there are challenges, but also there are differences. I mean, from the time during Cordesa, mm. knowing where we came from, where men will sit around the table and it will be normal. During Cordesa, women were able to say, we are not represented. Our, our voices are not uh, around the table, yeah. which was dis deciding the future of the country. If you look at the constitution, it entrenched the equality clause, uh, the constitution of South Africa. As early as 1995, women from South Africa led a biggest delegation yeah. to Beijing, uh, raising issues of equality, uh, no violence against women, uh, economic inclusion. So, I, of course, the legislation. Yeah. We, we have come up with the kind of legislation which was meant to protect women, it's not only the rights, uh, but also against perpetrators mm -hmm. uh, of violence against women. And, and I wanted to pick your brain on, on what you think that is. But, uh, you know, many gender activists are saying that it is a, a reflection of our country as a whole. We are a patriarchal uh, a society. And I, I just want to, to um, reflect on what uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa um, said during that keynote address that he, he delivered on Friday, specifically speaking about issues of patriarchy. We must acknowledge here, as we have in the past, the stubborn persistence of patriarchy that leads men to think that they are superior to the women of our country, to their mothers, to their wives and their daughters, is something that is still a great problem in our country. We must acknowledge here, as we have in the past, that many men assume that they have the right to decide whether or not a girl should go to school, or how a woman should dress, or how a woman should behave. These attitudes are driving the abuse of women across society. Whether they are young or old, black or white, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, atheist, rural or urban, gender conforming or non-gender conforming. As South Africans, we can no longer stand by as this evil sinks deeper and deeper roots in our society. That's President yeah. Cyril Ramaphosa just reflecting on how pervasive patriarchy is and it lives in our homes, it lives in our communities and even in the workplace. Yeah, you know, what, 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 what is really good is the political commitment in tackling these issues. I mean, the way the president tackled it, he, he, I, I, I suppose it shocked many people, uh, especially men in positions of power, be it in the church or uh, tribal authorities or men in charge of entities and organizations. But it also lives in, in, in politics. Do you think that there is a willingness for women like yourself to push projects that are needed, um, to implement what is needed to, to improve the lives of women? You know, in politics, I think we've made some gains in the sense that at a point when women said we won 50-50 in terms of representation, not only to see women at the bottom of the page, but a zebra, a man, women, men, women, and so on. Uh, right now, that has been achieved. Even when you look at members of parliament, we're almost there. I think women are at 48%. But when it comes to executives, I think we, we, we are there. We are at 50 but it's, it's a, it's a worldwide, worldwide phenomenon. It comes from, you know, the, traditionally there will be professions uh, uh, which were, were, preserved, were a preserve of men. If you wanted to be uh, in engineering, you find that there's only one yeah. uh, engineer. But also the president spoke about the number of students in universities that girls are exceeding uh, uh, young men now. They are doing well. 
Why do you say But how that? many of those are, are girls from rural areas that, that really need to go to university, for example? They always say that if you want change, you start with education. How do we um, ensure that access is, is provided to those girls who live in, in predominantly rural areas? I think there has been a conscious effort with most government programs like NESFAS to ensure that they, they are prioritized they are paid, they are given special attention. And also what helps are these institutions of higher learning which are based in the most remote rural areas. And so most of them can get in. But in the context of patriarchy that the president was talking about, what's important is for those institutions to ensure that girls are not confronted by the dominance of men mm. as senior academics and professors mm -hmm. and, and, and of course even the curriculum in some instances transformation has not been at the right pace to ensure that we, 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 we dismantle mm. this and I'd like us to, to talk to speak to that uh, when we return from the break I am in conversation with uh, the deputy minister and the presidency of women youth and people living with disabilities professor Shingiwe Mkize uh, more on this when we return stay tuned to the PM edition of Newsfeed right here on Newsroom Africa, Channel 405. My name is Busisiwa Kumete and we are in conversation with Professor Sengiwe uh, Mkize, who is the Deputy Minister in the Presidency, who is looking over, of course, the issues of women, youth, as well as people living with disabilities. So thank you so much again for your time, Mama. We, we spent the first part of this interview just talking about access to education, more specifically with uh, women and 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 the youth as well but let's let's talk about uh, gender-based violence which continues to be an issue uh, for for women uh, in fact I'm reminded by uh, the EFF's Naledi Chirwa who who always says that women are not safe women can't breathe in in their spaces well I'm reminded of what the president did last year uh, more than any of the political parties uh, for the first time he decided that he needs to have a summit on gender-based violence and femicide. And he instructed the Department of Justice to play a leading role, of course, with the support of social development, the presidency, the Department of Women then, which was very, very important because it sent a clear message, not only to women, but the country at large, that things have reached the, 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 the levels of violence have yeah. reached highest proportion to a point where they've attracted uh, the highest office on the land. Mm. And post the, sum, uh, the summit, there has been a declaration which has been signed. And you know what is interesting is that some of the resolutions are things that the country already had agreed upon, like the Sexual Offences Court, the establishment of Tutuzela centers, which will ensure that there are proper investigations and all the necessary tests are taken so that the cases can st stand, a, a, a pass a test in a court of law. Mm. Uh, but it, besides all those interventions were challenges, we, we, we have now the strength of the support of the president, the budget that has put, put in, the commitment uh, for the steering committee that the president established to actually start cons consultations. But are those, are those interventions working when we look at, you know, summits being held um, year in and year out? Um, many activists are saying these are talk shops and are happening at a high level in urban areas and not reaching women who are in rural areas or maybe even in townships. How do we go beyond just having, you know, talk shops in, in air ventilated rooms and spaces and, and, and really ensuring that we, we fill that out and, and that goes to the people who actually really need it? Well, we, we fully agree. I think we are all in agreement that whatever interventions which are meant to tackle this social ill should not be in our golden cities. 
I mean, during the build, build up, we had to meet with the women leaders, the organization Bahumahadi, of mothers, uh, or, uh, of sons and yes. kings who are in, in because we realize this is a big issue. If we don't tackle communities in rural areas, then we are not gonna be able to uh, eliminate violence in society. So I think we are all in agreement that there are no safety zones. So our interventions should actually have a bias towards those communities where cultural teachings and traditions mm -hmm. are still strong and intact and actually show people that there are good aspects of our culture, but there are instances, like in instances where women as young as the age of 15 yes. or below that yeah. are married to older men, where they are exploited, sometimes by men who are already sick, and then they are destroyed, their lives are destroyed. And that happens mainly in the most remote rural areas. Mm. And we, there's another area where we're still going to visit during this month, mm. where women are killed. They are told to be, you are a witch, then you will be killed, and the whole community will, will, will it's more justice, basically. Mm. And we'll take a, a, um, just a look at what uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa had to say about gender-based violence in a bit, but um, I just, I'm keen on getting your personal view of what you think is the solution to, to gender-based violence, because it's so linked to what we talked about earlier, about, you know, patriarchy and, and women sometimes not being, um, you know, empowered with the information to know how to deal with um, issues of abuse in the household. Um, it also ties in with women not, not being, you know, economically active because they rely on these men who are, you know, beating them up every single day. Personally speaking, Mama, as, as a person who's been in, in, in this field, you know, what I, I think, the, we, you know, we must be able to make some shifts and move forward. Um, this morning at 7 o'clock, I listened to the sermon in one of the churches, yes. the powerful churches in this country. The whole sermon was on no violence against women, uh, dedicated to this month, aligning with the president's speech, which for me said the kind of acceptance we have as of today is gonna go a long way. Because remember, it has been women talking about these issues. The president touched on it a bit uh, uh, in terms of the, this hashtag of, of men who have been mobilized and they are talking to issues yeah. that they must mm. own up to and ensure that they, they eliminate the suffering of uh, Women. Yes, in fact, let's let's go to that um, address now, or rather that that bite from the president who was speaking about gender-based violence. Gender-based violence is a crisis across our land. It is the worst form of desecration of the constitution and its premise of gender equality in our country. Since 1994. We have passed laws to curb domestic violence and sexual violence. We have set up specialized courts and units within the South African Police Service to ensure that perpetrators of violence against women and children are successfully prosecuted. We are providing shelter and support services for women and girls who have fled from abuse. Despite our best efforts, despite our progressive laws and policies, this country's women and girls continue to live in fear. On the streets, in the schools, in universities, in churches, in places of worship, and worst of all, in their own homes, Many women in our country live in fear. Women of South Africa continue to live in fear. That is word from President Cyril Ramaphosa, just speaking to the issue of gender-based violence and just general violence meted out on women. Uh, a very key 
area in this, of course, is the treatment that women get when they um, report cases against men at police stations, not getting, you know, the support that they need there. Yeah, you know, we have a Domestic Violence Act. Of course, that's why we are saying we've, we've, we've come a long way in terms of legislation. But unfortunately, when you go to these offices, you find that some people are still in violation of the very uh, legislation that should guide them in terms of how to protect women. We know of, we have cases of women who have been turned away from the police station by the, the police saying, what kind of a woman? You are here to report your husband. Aren't you married? Didn't he pay Lobola for you? So it means we have, you know, we, we need stronger monitoring mechanisms. And what are those mechanisms? Mechanisms whereby, you know, the steering committee that we are talking about and the revival of the uh, Gender Violence Council, which was introduced a bit during uh, Deputy President Halima Muntlante's time uh, and Minister Lulu Kingwane, mm -hmm. and it didn't uh, pick up. Now there's a move towards establishing it. So in each and every area, we ought to have areas where people can report their experiences. So if, if, if there has been an establishment that it's not working, why is it that we, we're not finding new ways of, of monitoring whether or not, for example, police are doing their jobs? Well, it's also, you know, we've been doing too many things. Also transformation. Some of the, those uh, po police who have been uh, further victimizing women are people who themselves were patriarchal in their mindset. They find themselves in these positions where they must protect women. They, they might have been abusers themselves and they, were, they didn't understand what's a big deal. I've, I've, I've beaten up a woman before. Mm -hmm. I've been it, beaten up children. You know, South Africa, when we started, the issue of transformation was big in our agenda. And in the process, you find that it's almost like after a decade, there are new people whereby you must start all over again. I, I, you know, I was glad. I saw that uh, there was a platform where women judges had a platform. Because sometimes when women appear in court, uh, again, it's almost like nobody understands what they've gone through. The mm -hmm. kind of, the line of questioning, it, it, it further traumatizes them and actually act as a deterrent mm -hmm. and many people end up not reporting cases yeah i'm speaking now in terms of for example policy and the action that is taken and there seems to be a chasm between the 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 intent of trying to ensure that women get the services that they need for example at, and i'll make this example again at a police station and the, the action or the implementation if you have already established that women are not getting those services and they're being turned away from uh, the police station. Why is it that you know, you're not putting in place the implement or rather the action that is needed to ensure that you know, police officers are monitored? You know, as of today, there's now a talk of a budget for civil society organizations that are assisting those women Remember, we come from an era where funding for NGOs stopped completely in South Africa, the funding which was there before 1994. But this kind of work cannot succeed if the, the, these women who have been uh, violated, especially younger women, are not accompanied by activists who understand issues, who can put, put up a fight yeah. if they are not satisfied, and who can actually even go to court, as they've been saying, that they are happy to be friends of the court to support younger women. You know of cases that are taking place yeah. in PE, mm -hmm. uh, Sharon Zondi case, yeah. which is uh, of younger women like her are in the court of law backing for justice. All right. Of course, we are in conversation with Professor uh, Lengiwe Mkize, who is the Deputy Minister of Women, Youth and People with Disabilities in the Presidency. We continue with this discussion, but do let us know uh, what you think so far and what questions you would like me to put to her at Newsroom 405 on Twitter. Stay tuned.
you live from our studios in Linden. A very good afternoon to you. This is the PM edition of Newsfeed, and my name is Busisiwe Kumete. We are in a conversation with uh, Professor Sengiwe um, Mkize, who is a deputy minister in the presidency responsible for women, youth, and people with disabilities. And that is um, one key issue that I want to touch on, just the challenges uh, faced by people living with disabilities, the issue of mobility, not enough ranks um, or ramps um, you know, in facilities that you and I can easily access, for example, malls and, and, and clinics. Um, what's your take on, on those challenges so far? I think we all have to do more uh, from government to the private sector in terms of uh, ensuring that we create a conducive environment. As part of a build-up, we came across a woman who said uh, she left teaching because the school was just not responding. Whenever she said, I need routes between classes to be able to drive my, my, my wheelchair, and nobody was responding, she just gave up and she left. You know, when I was in higher education, we visited a few institutions of higher learning which had facilities where they were using special gadgets, technology, computers yeah. to help with whatever deficits that students had and allow them to be competitive and to get their decisions like all other people. But we realized that the majority of young people would have dropped out quite early because our schools then did, did not have facilities. For instance, if you were deaf, uh, they, they wouldn't have a facility, except if you are in an urban area where you get to a, a, a schools for the deaf. You will, the parents won't know how to do, and you'll be left behind. But I think with the investments in early child development that government has made, we have an opportunity to screen young people as early as possible, so as to ensure that those who require hearing aids, they get them as early as possible by the time they start school, so that they don't get into a track of a social wage. Mm. It is in, in, in basic education level where um, the real challenges are, especially for those uh, living with disability. Uh, for example, the Riboni School for the Blind in Limpopo, which has been featured in, in various reports, even one uh, that was produced by Equal Education, and it shows that uh, children there, or school pupils there, who are about probably 50 students in that school, don't even have access to Braille typewriters. Um, the facility there is really, really disheartening. Um, the, the facility where they sleep as well is, is not fit for people who cannot see. How is this possible in 2019? Yeah, you see, that's why the president has been signing social compacts with partners. For instance, us, we don't have all the solutions, but we can only work in partnership with other departments and the private sector. As but I'm sure you have the responsibility of ensuring that those partnerships that you ha have yield uh, the, the, the results that you need on the ground. It's a huge responsibility we have because we can no longer allow uh, the discrimination against uh, people with special needs. In all over the world, all countries, they invest in those young people young people with special needs. So one but of the- But are we investing enough um, to our children I with think special needs? Are we, are we doing that? Are we seeing that on the ground? And that's the question that I'm putting to you. Yeah, it's true. In some areas, there are serious concerns where you find that even where there's a school, there are deficits. But I think even within basic education, there are clear direct, uh, directions that they've taken to work in partnership with partners from the private sector, especially in the ICTs, in the area of information com communication and technology. And I don't think such schools, we can no longer, you know, there's, the president emphasized Kauleza. What we did slowly or on a small scale, we don't have that luxury. Even in his speech, he mentioned it, and he has been emphasizing it in all our planning sessions that we have to work at a different pace because we are ensuring that nobody continues to be left behind. So it's like this sixth administration 
should be a cutoff point for any of the exclusions that have been there in society. Because at the end, when you talk unemployment, when you talk poverty, is those groups that have not been included and part of driving the, 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 the growth in society. Not While those projects try and find their feet, many young people living with disabilities are excluded. Many of those young children are not able to get the basic education that they need, which means that they won't be able to go to university, which means that their whole life has been compromised. For how long will they have to wait for, for real change to happen on the ground? I think we know that, for instance, they are no longer floating as a project on the side of social development, but they constitute a new ministry of women, youth, and persons with disabilities. Mm. We, we, when we start a campaign now, we have to work in partnerships with tribal authorities, with religious bodies, which are in all our society, to start a campaign for next year that they can no longer be left behind because of a deficit, but they should uh, be taken to a nearer schools and assess and given all the opportunities they require. And, and of course, you know, the most important thing about activism is not how many years it takes, but is to continue with that spirit of believing that we will overcome it. And, and I think that's how it helped us to overcome the apartheid system. Because the laws are good, the policies are good, all what is needed now is a human spirit to fight even more if there's a child who is left behind in the village. And, and there are people who can uh, create awareness, as yeah. they do, with offense and all that. The president sp spoke about special projects where government is looking after offense. Same applies to young people, children who are left behind because of disabilities. All right. I think that's where we will have to leave it. Uh, it's a big, you know, responsibility that you have because it incorporates women, you know, the youth and persons living with disability. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, that's where we're going to have to leave it. But thank you so much uh, for your time and we're wishing you all the best going forward. Thank you. Thank All you right. for having us. All right. That was Professor Thengibem Kize, who is the Deputy Minister in the Presidency, um, looking over, of course, uh, women, youth and persons living with disability. Well, let's take an ad break now. We will be back in a bit.